When describing Japanese cuisine, it's best summed up in two words, natural and harmony. A sense of season, a feeling for nature, and an eye for color. According to Japanese tradition, the more beautiful food appears, the more delicious it is thought to be. Such a meal not only satiates one's hunger, but also stimulates the mind and senses. Japanese cuisine is shaped by the four distinct seasons and by its regions. It is a cuisine that first and foremost delights the senses. The eyes, nose, and palate feast along with the stomach. The Kaiseki style of cuisine is meant to satisfy the hunger of the soul for beauty, as much as that of the body for sustenance. For centuries, the calls of vegetable peddlers have announced the changes of season for the people of Kyoto. Their carts are now filled with the bounty of autumn, a palette of rich and mellow hues. The beauty of their surroundings has always profoundly influenced the sensibilities of the Kyoto people. The desire to celebrate this natural splendor is reflected in many of their arts, including cuisine. Here, in the Arashiyama section of Kyoto, is a restaurant dedicated to the art of kaiseki. The gate blends in subtly with its surroundings. There is no need for this restaurant to call attention to itself. Those who treasure the place know very well where it is. For half a century, this restaurant has catered to the appetites of a clientele that know and love its traditions as much as its renowned cuisine. In marked contrast to the serenity of the grounds, the kitchen is abuzz with activity. Some 30 chefs, each assigned a given task, are hard at work. This kitchen is the domain of Koji Tokooka, the owner and master chef. This has been a second home to him from the age of 16, when he began his initiation into the traditions of Japanese cuisine. Tokooka is a hands-on owner in the truest sense, controlling every aspect of preparation and service. His attention to detail is absolute. These spider crabs are as fresh as possible, having been rushed here from a fishing boat on the Japan Sea. Even the leaves used in garnishing the dishes are gathered the same morning from a nearby mountain and are meticulously selected and cleaned. The ingredients themselves display a natural grace. A consciousness of the season and the ability to reflect in its choice of ingredients is the most vital requirement for properly executing a kaiseki dish. It goes without saying the cooking skill is necessary, but much more important are the ingredients. When a guest is satisfied enough with his meal to say compliments to the chef, perhaps 80% of the enjoyment derives from the ingredients rather than the chef's skill. The freshness and taste of the ingredients are of paramount importance. The chef's role is to use those ingredients in a way that suits their intrinsic nature, 
and realizes their potential for expression. This is one of the primary aims of kaiseki cuisine. These dishes, conceived specially for New Year's Day and served on batagos, reflect the vibrancy and exuberance of the season. Sea bream, black beans, Chinese water chestnuts, and smoked salmon provide the bold coloring. Each of these ingredients was carefully selected based on color, texture, freshness, suitability for the season, and compatibility with the other elements of the dish. Deep in the recesses of the garden, separated from the main restaurant, is Tokaoka's greatest treasure, a tea house. This modest structure is a refuge of tranquility from the pressures and cares of the outside world. Every step of the tea ceremony is to be savored slowly. The rock path encourages a slow and measured approach. Toka Oka sees to every detail personally. He's preparing for one of the most important tea ceremonies of the year, called Kuchi Karanokaji. It is the occasion of the first tasting of the tea harvested in early summer. Toka Oka calls on his artistic sensibilities and decades of experience to create the ideal environment for calm reflection. Toka Oka has chosen a scroll to set the tone. On the scroll, is a waka, a short poem, which extols the maple leaves of Mount Agoriyama. It is an ancient scroll, priceless, said to have been made by Kobori Enshu. Enshu was a follower of Sen no Rikyu, the originator of the tea ceremony as it is practiced today. Also precious is Tokaoka's collection of plates and bowls. For the coming tea ceremony, Tokaoka will choose from among the more than 6,000 plates and bowls in the restaurant's storerooms, including those collected by the previous owner, and those made by contemporary craftsmen expressly for Tokaoka. This exquisite plate, made by renowned Kyoto potter Hiroko Kai the 15th, is shaped like a crane in flight. The plate is much more than just a frame for Tokaoka's culinary creations. It plays as great a role in creating the proper mood as the food itself. This gorgeous wooden bowl and its companions of make lacquerware were decorated by Tawaraya Sutatsu, a celebrated 17th century painter. The autumn-like hues play off the theme of the waka poem. As for vegetables, Tokaoka need not look outside his own city. The vegetables sold in Kyoto are famous throughout the country. Masataka Haguchi, who comes from a long line of Kyoto farmers, brings vegetables picked this very morning into downtown Kyoto. The Haguchi farm is actually located within the city. Haguchi raises some 20 varieties of vegetables. Just now, he's harvesting leeks, red turnips, and spinach. Yeah, 
Since Higuchi's vegetables play a prominent role in his cuisine, Tokaoka frequently visits to check on the progress of the crops. Mm. Mm. Tokaoka is amazed at how soft and sweet the turnips are. Most chefs are very particular about the quality of meat or fish they prepare. But it's surprising how few are as conscientious when it comes to vegetables. It's a chef's duty not only to his guests, but also to the farmer who puts so much effort into raising them to serve the vegetables as fresh as possible. Tokaoka reserves spinach and turnips to be picked and delivered on the morning of the tea ceremony. With preparations now complete, Tokaoka writes out the menu. This is his last chance to reconsider his choices, their balance in relation to one another, and suitability for the expected guests. There will be a total of 15 dishes served, beginning with rice, soup, and raw fish, followed by boiled and baked dishes. The basic order of the dishes served is very rigid, never deviating from time-honored custom. The ceremony begins with the arrival of the guests, precisely 15 minutes before the scheduled start. It would be extremely bad manners to arrive either too early or too late. Before entering the tea house, they rinse their hands and mouths, symbolically cleansing their bodies and minds. The first thing the guests do upon entering the tea house is pause to reflect on the scroll and tea jar in the alcove. The tea jar selected for today's ceremony was brought to Japan from Luzon in the Philippines in the 16th century. The formal greeting. Though Tokaoka is as much the master here as in his own kitchen, his manner is markedly different. In order to serve the dishes as soon as possible after preparation, a small kitchen has been set up next to the tea room. Higuchi's turnips will be used for the boiled dish. Soup stock is made of bonito and seaweed. The light soy sauce was chosen for its ability to enhance without dominating the taste. Seabream, which is best in autumn, is used extensively in kaiseki dishes during the season. 
Today, Sebring was rushed directly from nearby Awajishima Island. Tokaoka reveals the three teas he has chosen. All three selections are grown locally. The tea was harvested in early summer and carefully put away to age. The tea's fragrance and taste have just reached their peak. Kaiseki cuisine was influenced by the modest past of Zen monks. The monks used to place a warm stone next to their stomachs to help them bear their hunger. This is the origin of the term kaiseki, which means literally placing a warm stone. Sen no Rikyu took Zen monks' dishes as the model for tea ceremony cuisine. He left numerous records of the menus he personally used. The menus are extremely sparse. A typical menu might include rice, soup, burdock, baked fish, and salted sea cucumber innards. Sen no Rikyu's dishes strive for the simple harmony of Zen. It is time to serve the first dishes. Timing is of the essence, as they must be served immediately after preparation. Rice, soup, and raw fish always lead off the meal. Special care is afforded the rice and soup, which must be served steaming hot. Three types of rice dishes are offered at different points in the meal. The first is called jitamishi, a kind of rice gruel. The second and third rice dishes are progressively firmer in texture. Dishes are served literally the moment they are prepared. The master always serves the dishes personally during the tea ceremony.
By custom, the guests eat the rice dish first, but only a few morsels. The point is not to satisfy their hunger. It is the essence of rice they came to taste. The white miso soup is similarly spare. The ingredients are sesame tofu, azuki beans, and mustard. Next, the raw fish, always served in season. Here, it is sea bream. The first three dishes, conforming perfectly to tradition, yet bearing Tokaoka's distinctive style. The next three dishes are served in the order considered most suitable for the guests' enjoyment. Tokaoka serves a boiled dish, followed by a baked dish, then a side dish with sake, Japanese rice wine. Called Ogenjo Moki, this boiled dish is made of quail meat and rice cake. A garnish was added to reinforce the seasonable impression. Boiled dishes serve as the centerpiece of kaiseki meals. For the baked dish, bonito, coated in a citrus-flavored soy sauce and baked over charcoal. Even the color and length of the bamboo chopsticks are carefully chosen to harmonize with the food and plate. The next dish, known as shizakana, is a traditional complement to sake. Here it is made of turnips, spinach, and bean curd. After sake, Hasen, here made of dried melithro, is served. The plate of Japanese cedar keeps with the rustic tradition of the ceremony. The essence of the season is distilled in this simple cup. There is so much history in Kaiseki. Certain themes and patterns are repeated periodically. I made up today's menu thinking only of the ingredients available to me now that best suited the season. It struck me only later that the meal I served was exactly the same as prepared by Fumiko, a famous tea master who lived several centuries ago. That continuity gives me great peace of mind. I know through practicing this tradition, I'm not defying time, but living in harmony with it. A tradition, by definition, ties its practitioner to the past. Kaiseki is a living tradition. Those who experience it feel a bond with not only the spirits of the past, but also the spirits of the nature surrounding them in the present. They feel not only what was, but what is. Motorcycles, icons of pop culture that unite their riders by one feeling. Freedom, freedom. I like being free. From the origins of the Indian, to the modern designs of the Ducati, to the mother of all hogs, Harley Davidson, will show you the early days and introduce you to the inventors, designers, and engineers who made it all possible. Plus, you'll get a backstage pass to the real biker lifestyle. For one week, a sleepy town of 7,000 becomes the hub for some of the wildest parties, craziest characters, and most beautiful rides in America. This is wild. I love this. Sturgis, the Black Hills. This is the wildest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Jump on the back and take a ride down the open road. 
and we'll show you how the writers of today are shaping the designs of tomorrow. Revolution on Wheels, now playing on Discovery HD Theater. In Japan, the line between art and ordinary life is often indistinct. A case in point, these carefully conceived works of art capture the essence of the changing seasons. From vibrant early autumn hues to stark and somber shades with the dying of the year. Beautiful, but not destined for display alone. These are kiyogashi, traditional Japanese sweets. At certain times and places, Kyoto presents a decidedly modern face to the world. Yet even in the city's center, the distance between the new and the old seems measured more in time than space. This confectionery shop in the Michigan area of Kyoto has remained largely unchanged since its establishment in 1882. Inside works one of Kyoto's 26 kashao, or master confectioners. Behind the shop's placid facade, the kashao and their assistants are hard at work. Masaaki Takaya attained the highest rank in his profession, kashao or master, only three years ago when he succeeded to his late father's place. Each shop produces its own distinct types of kiyogashi, differing in shape, color, taste, and name. There are therefore literally thousands of varieties. This shop alone makes over 200 basic kinds of kiyogashi a year, each of which is varied depending on the season. While the varieties of kiyogashi are nearly limitless, there are only three primary ingredients, azuki beans, sugar, and flour. Concepts find realization in the kitchen. But for inspiration, Takaya looks outside his walls to the natural beauty surrounding his city. At the end of November, he and his eldest son, Keitok, made the short trip to Sagano, a suburb of Kyoto. As Kashao, Takaya alone makes all final artistic decisions. But he knows the value of collaboration, perhaps through the eyes of his son, a university student studying design. He may find something to inspire the new confections he'll create for the year-end exhibition of Kashao handiwork. The theme of this year's annual exhibition is the Four Seasons. Together, father and son strive to capture the spirit of late autumn in their sketches, which will serve as the basis of the new sweet designs. Takaya has already chosen a working title for his entry, Girding for Winter. Back at home, Takaya searches for the images that most eloquently express his impressions of the day in Sagano. He chooses three. A fence made of bamboo branches. A sheaf of rice straw. Finally, a radish hanging to dry. Dried radishes are a traditional winter food in Japanese farming villages. Yeah, 
K-Talk wonders why the bamboo fence is included. Does it really fit the theme? Takaya explains that its function of protection, made from the dead branches used in its construction, evoke impending winter. The joy of this art is having the freedom to choose and create the images I want. If taste were the only important consideration, it wouldn't be as enjoyable. It's a given that a successful confection must taste good, but to me, the more exciting challenge is in the design. He can see the elements in his mind's eye. Now, he must give them a form. Takaya's particular specialty is sugar-based sweets. One of his favorite materials is alahato, because it can easily be given various shapes. He decides to use alahato for the sheaf of rice straw. The base ingredient is white crystalline sugar. He adds a little malt jelly to enhance its cohesiveness. Next, Takaya brings the mixture to a boil. He lets it boil until just before it burns. This is the key part of the process when both taste and appearance are decided. The intensity of the flame and the proportion of ingredients differ from shop to shop. Each has its own traditional taste. Patiently, Takaya forms strand after strand from the golden syrup until he has caught the effect he's looking for. He is in unknown territory, never having attempted this design before. Unfortunately, the strands are too fragile to bear their own weight. This time, he makes the strands considerably thicker. Again, Takaya is at an impasse. If he makes the strands too thick, they lose their individual shapes as they overlap. The solution hits him. If he holds the spoon higher, the syrup will have partially solidified by the time it lands. 
and the strands will be both thin and strong. Finally, Takaya is satisfied. Takaya uses 13 varieties of sugar in his confections. Each has its own unique taste and application. He uses wasanban sugar as much as he can. Wasanban is distinguished by its smooth texture and subtle sweetness. It had fallen out of general use until just after World War II, when Takaya's father, the previous Kashao, championed its revival. <laughs> The sugar cane used for wasanban is harvested at the end of November. Every year, the farmer personally brings a sample to the shop. Wasanban's taste can vary greatly depending on the quality of the sugar cane. There is a long history of mutual trust here. Takaya's father greatly appreciated this farmer for steadily supplying him the hard-to-find wasanban. <laughs> Takaya now turns to the second confection, representing a bamboo fence. This time, he will use Oshimono to convey the strength and solidity of the fence. He mixes bean paste, wasanban, and rice flour. He then presses it into a block. The choice of color was crucial. Takaya opted for a rustic reddish brown, derived from the addition of the bean paste. Oshimono conveys the solidity of the fence well, but communicating the strength of the individual bamboo stalks is the challenge. Takaya decides to try drawing them with a hot iron. Takaya, his son, and his apprentice discuss the work in progress. The fence needs more lines, the apprentice points out. Katok suggests making the confection longer, then trimming off the ends. This will emphasize the fence's length strengthening the impression that it is only one section. <laughs> Pleased with his son's idea, Takaya does just that. It is complete, but Takaya still has his doubts. Did he successfully capture the strength of the stalks? Mm. 
The exhibition is in two days. Each Kashao is putting the finishing touches on his own interpretation of this natural beauty. Now that the elements are complete, Takaya must call on all his artistic sensibilities to determine their arrangement. No one confection should dominate, but an absolute balance is to be equally avoided. Something is not quite right. It has been bothering Takaya for days. The lines branded onto the ashimono for the bamboo fence are too severe. They don't suit the calm expectancy of the season. Time is running out, but he must find another way. He continues to consider and experiment. Before he knows it, the day of the exhibition has arrived. Kitana Tamangu was originally chosen as the exhibition venue because of its historical association with the art of the tea ceremony. Kiyogashi are always eaten as part of that ceremony. An elaborate tea ceremony is also staged here every winter to commemorate the Katano Grand Tea Ceremony performed by the famous Lord Toyotami Hideyoshi nearly four centuries ago. These 26 kashao embody the living tradition passed down from the early Jogashio confectioners. The kashao not only keep alive the distinctive tastes and traditions of their respective shops, but continually advance the art, introducing original confections year after year. Though his mastery is unquestioned in his own kitchen, here, among his peers, Takaya feels the pressure of living up to his establishment's respective name. In this distinguished company, he feels a relative apprentice, having succeeded to the title of Kashao so recently. Whatever reception his work meets with, Takaya can feel confident that he has done his best. After much trial and error, he came upon the perfect way to represent the bamboo fence. He used twigs of real bamboo to form the impression on the Oshimano. girding for winter. Its apparent simplicity belies the pains taken to complete it. <laughs> Confectioners from all over Japan flock to this exhibition to seek inspiration from the work of the masters. Named Nuku Nuku, this confection evokes late autumn bonfires. Wabiske, the flower is made of cornishi, and the leaves of hochimono.
Kitayama. Sugar sprinkled on sweet bean jelly represents snow on mountains. Rice cake frost on a chrysanthemum flower made of cornishi. Here, Jojo Manju forms a snow covered landscape. Each master applies a sophisticated sensibility of his own to the theme of the Four Seasons. Takaya is on pins and needles, waiting for his fellow Kashao, who are familiar with his father's work, to pass judgment on his entry. Like any artist who has poured his soul into his work, I am apprehensive about showing it in public for the first time. My value as an artist is there on that tray. Will the meaning and beauty I see communicate to others? The answers are written on the faces of the crowd. Though rejection is terrible, too much acceptance can be worse in a way, as it could lead to complacency. The great part of my motivation comes from the challenge of improving on what I've done before. Though he would never force him to follow a given path, Takaya hopes that his son feels the same fascination with the art that compelled him to become a Kiyogashi maker. Late December, the year-end festivals are in full swing. Near Takaya's shop, the Daikon Deki is held. Festival goers eat radishes and wish for peace and freedom from accidents or sickness during the coming year. This is the busiest season for the Kiyogashi makers, as traditional sweets are part of many festivities. Kiyogashi and those who make them are a valuable part of the rich cultural life of Kyoto. The confectioners draw on the beauty and deep artistic appreciation abounding here, while their work enriches the ancient city's living tradition.